Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Authentic ID. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning, where we have an exciting program ahead. But before we get things kicked off, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review with you. First of all, we are recording today's session. So if you have to step out, if you miss any of today's program, you want to rewatch, or of course, if you'd like to share with your team, you will be receiving the on-demand recording via email shortly after we conclude this live session. If you'd like to engage with us, there are a couple of options for you to do so. The first option is the chat tab, which you'll find on the right side of your screen. So if you see that chat tab, I'd like you to test it out by letting us know from where in the world you're joining us. Now, if you do have any specific questions, we do want you to send those into the Q&A tab. The Q&A tab can be found directly on the right side of the chat tab. And we do want you to reserve that for any questions you have for our hosts or our speakers. Uh, sending in your questions to Q&A helps us keep track and we want to include as many of your questions as we can. Now we will have two polls that we'll be launching throughout today's program. So keep an eye out for whenever those pop up. And before we close out today, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around, see if you're one of our lucky winners. So our topic today is building trust in digital identity verifications, account enrollment, and beyond. And I'm joined today by Blair Cohen, president and founder of Authentic ID, Will Charnley, managing director of Liminal, Stephanie Goldner, Senior Product Manager for Biometrics and Device-Based Authentication at Capital One. And leading our conversation is our very own Mitch Ashley, CTO of TechStrong Group and Principal at TechStrong Research. So I would like to thank Stephanie, Will, and Blair for joining us today, but the pleasure is handing it over to Mitch to hear what these experts have to say. So Mitch, you wanna take it from here? Fantastic. Thank you, Cody, and uh, echo our, our thank you to our panel today. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm happy to be with you. We're talking about building trust in digital identity verifications and counter enrollment and beyond. It's interesting because I feel like I do this every day and it's changing as we're using the applications and systems and business relationships in our digital world. So, uh, you know, it's not only keeping it secure, but how do we deliver that experience? I think is a lot of what we're going to talk about that so that uh, customers are successful. We build trust with them as we shift from in-person, in-branch uh, to digital accounts and digital experiences and how we combat some best practices around combating fraud and and uh, delivering more seamless customer experiences. So we're gonna talk about a number of things and I'm really pleased to be joined by our panel. So before we get into diving into the, the conversation, I wanted to give them an opportunity to let them know a little bit about more about themselves, let you know about them. So Blair, would you, would you kick things off? Love to hear a little bit more about you and Authentic ID. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for hosting us today. And yeah, I'd be happy to. So Blair Cohen, I'm the founder, president of Authentic ID. Authentic ID is a next generation identity company that services major enterprises across a bunch of different verticals, uh, as well as government customers. So throughout the, the past couple of years, we've seen pretty much everybody in the U U.S.'s identity. So it's been an interesting ride. Fantastic. I think that's a good thing you've seen my identity. I hope it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Uh, Will, would you introduce yourself? You're on mute, probably. We're not hearing you, Will. Does it look like he's on mute? No, it doesn't show mute. Give him a chance to look at that. Not hearing you yet. Maybe Cody, Cody can help you in the background while we're working on this. Um, Stephanie, would you jump in? Yep, of course. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here and, and a part of the panel. My name is Stephanie Goldner. I'm a senior product manager at Capital One, focusing on innovation and uh, around biometrics and device-based verification. Uh, in terms of my background, I spent a lot of time at startups helping to build and launch digital products and experiences both internationally 
and here in the United States, and more recently have been supporting large enterprises in doing the same. Uh, and most recently at Capital One, thinking through how to build out secure and low friction experiences for our customers. You are living the dream, exactly what we're talking about today, for sure. Will, how are you doing? How are your? Uh, I, I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you, you are. Okay. Perfect. Fantastic. Sorry about that. Uh, my team would be very happy. You know, they're they're always trying to get me to shut up. So <laughs> it's good. So uh, thanks for having me, uh, Mitch, and and excited to be on this panel. Will Charnley, Managing Director at Liminal. Uh, Liminal is a preeminent uh, strategy advisory and research firm. Um, focused squarely in digital identity. So we work with um, investors, um, solution providers like Authentic ID, um, as well as solution seekers, in some cases like Capital One. So um, we sit kind of squarely in this market. We are, uh, we're a team of kind of trusted advisors there um, and have deep kind of expertise in this space. So really good for today's conversation. Very cool. Um, let's see, do we have Blair back? I think he may have dropped in joining again. If so, not a problem. We will continue to uh, bring him back into the conversation when he joins. Uh, Stephanie, would love to hear about you know what you're seeing as some of the fraud trends in the financial financial industry, and maybe what are the uh, approaches that uh, that you're taking or you see companies taking to respond to that. Yeah, of course, and happy to to kick us off. So. Um, in the past couple of years, we've seen a shift in consumer behavior, uh, and that's been true for the financial industry and across companies. The pandemic really drove consumer behavior online, and we've seen that that shift has also been true from a fraud point of view. Uh, so as organizations build great customer experiences online, they're trying to strike that balance of seamless and easy customer experiences while preventing fraud and keeping that high bar for security in a digital landscape. Um, biometric technology in particular provides a really interesting way to approach that challenge. It's recommended by identity experts for higher levels of assurance and research has shown that consumers are ready to adopt these experiences, you know, whether it's thanks to iPhone, um, right, for unlocking with facial recognition or various other um, examples of use cases. So we're really seeing the industry start to adopt biometric technology and explore biometric technology as a way to meet those customer demands online while keeping a high bar for security. It is pretty phenomenal how users have accepted so much change in how we identify, manage all of the identity parts of our world. It used to be just your your license, right? <laughs> your government ID was there. Will, hey, are you, are you back with us, Will? I'm sorry, Blair, I didn't mean Will. Blair, are you back with yeah. us? Yeah, Blair, I'm back. I've got you audio-wise. Can you hear me okay? That's the most important thing. We've got your audio, so welcome back. Um, I don't know. I've got a pretty face. I'm sorry that isn't being shown too. But Well, you got a nice photo. So <laughs> that'll <laughs> fill in for the video. So uh, Stephanie was sharing some fraud trends, and I want to put up a poll in a moment. But I also want to want you to help us kick things off of kind of what have you seen in the evolution uh, through the years of fraud in uh, in your industry experience? Set some context for us. Oh my gosh, we should have booked three hours for this, Mitch. But <laughs> it, it's been pretty unbelievable. So I've been in identity, if you will, directly in identity for about 13 years, but ancillary to identity in a previous company that I created a company called Infomart that does background checks. So I've literally been in the identity space for about 30 years. And what I've seen change is almost everything. Um, the tactics, the targets have changed pretty dramatically. The tactics they use have changed pretty dramatically. And now the technologies that they have available to them are, are really pretty incredible. So the targets 30 years ago used to be banks. You know, we went where the money was. Sorry, Stephanie, but that's just where everybody attacks. It's where the money was. Today, that attack landscape has broadened dramatically. It's no longer just banks. It is some surprising places. So you think about buy now, pay later. You think about 
push payments, you think about social media. Whoever thought about social media, but this is a tremendous attack vector. And maybe the most alarming trend that I've seen lately, Mitch, is you have the ability to validate a social security number directly through the Social Security Administration. And last year, out of those submitted to the Social Security admin, 7.9% of people lied about their social. They were not who they said they were. And you think about stealing money, that's bad, right? But we can all overcome stealing money. But I'm pretty frightened by the thought of an insider and what they can do, an insider in your IT department, an insider in your accounting department. So the targets have really changed. The tactics that they use have really changed a lot. It used to be, you know, all of us had poor passwords, one, two, three, four, five, six. So they were guessing passwords or able to go to your social media account and figure out what your password was. So it was pretty elementary, pretty, pretty rudimentary. Today, the tactics have to be far more sophisticated. The barriers that banks like Capital One in place put in place to stop this kind of fraud are, are pretty significant. I was recently talking to one of our telco customers, and they had a fraudster that was literally so talented that for one transaction, they were able to socially engineer three different people within the organization and retrieve those one-time passcodes from three different people. I mean, that takes a lot of sophistication, a lot of skill. Uh, but today, that skill with the technology is coming into play. You no longer have to be that skillful. Um, it used to be, we all saw the Tom Cruise video where it was AI and it wasn't ever him. That was done years ago before these tools existed, and that took somebody that had a great deal of skill and a lot of time, effort, and energy. Today, if somebody were listening to this webinar, they would have enough snippets of our voices to be able to realistically synthesize and recreate our voice. Um, that's pretty scary when the tools could be in the hands of a 10-year-old. So a lot has changed over the past 30 years. Targets, tactics, technologies, the three T's. <laughs> well, let's, let's, on that note, because some of the things we have in our poll also kind of looks a little bit to the future. Why don't we bring up our poll here and everybody vote. We'll see, uh, we'll see, no, the other one, Cody, sorry, the second one. Um, if you bring this one down, we wanted the first one. There we Good, go. I you saw this one. You know, reverse order. Why not? Uh, what what fraud threats are you currently struggling with? Most of your organization select all that apply, right? So, if folks want to take a moment, just tick off what things stand out the most to you, and jump right on it. We'll see. Well, as soon as we get enough votes in here, we'll start to show some of the data as people are voting. We'll kind of see it live voting as well. <clears throat> I was thinking about that first. First item, synthetic identities, right? We're now with AI and, of course, with ChatGPT and, and uh, all the things we can do with LLMs and um, creating graphics. You know, we're creating synthetic. There are companies that will create a synthetic you that you feed it text. And it will, it will do an avatar of you speaking in your voice and, and in your image. So it, uh, things are changing very fast. So interesting. Yeah, the synthetic idea is top of mind for, for many folks along with AI bot uh, attacks. We still have some votes coming in. We'll leave this open for a little while. Um, can you put that back up, Cody? Let's let's give, the, uh, give our panel a chance to kind of soak that in and talk about it. Since Blair, Blair you're talking about kind of a, the evolution Thinking about where we are looking forward, what's your reaction to this poll? I think we've got some pretty smart people in the audience here. Um, I would concur. Synthetics were just seen like crazy all over the place. I don't know if anybody, I don't want to give a plug for somebody else, but David Maiman is a professor at Georgia State University and his, his team of students um, spend their whole day in the dark web. And the synthetic identity problem is pretty significant. I was looking at a post from him yesterday, and they had from just one marketplace 
about 80 different cards that have been pre-approved and were ready for sale. And some of those cards had an $18,000 limit on those. So that was clearly a pretty well-baked and seasoned synthetic identity. But some of those, uh, you know, this is a tremendous problem. And I don't think that people are doing enough to detect the synthetic. So I would agree that that's the number one problem that we're seeing anyway. Stephanie, I'm curious about you, though. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I definitely agree with you on all of the points um, that you brought up. And synthetic identity fraud and theft is definitely one of the, the greater trends that we're seeing in the industry. I think um, I'll go back to another point that you made uh, about just how much easier it is for fraudsters to get information today. And to one of the points that I brought up, which is as consumers, you know, go online, they have so much more data that they're sharing across all of the different platforms, which gives fraudsters more data to work with to build these identities more effectively. And so I think that's that in particular is what makes it so hard um, to tackle as as a challenge. Mitch, I think you're on mute. I, I'm gonna wait, wait and actually just real quick. I I think um you know we we actually went and uh, uh, looked at uh, this market specifically um, around kind of buyer sentiment, uh, you know, sol solution seekers. Um, right. And what we we saw um, specifically around synthetic identity. And I think what was in there is also the potential risk of something like generative AI when it comes to creating synthetic identities. Um, Seventy percent of buyers were that was the number one concern that they had um, in the market um, in terms of their existing solutions and ability to handle um, the threat. Uh, so, you know, they have something it's not it's not capable of doing that. Um, which I think really kind of underscores the the need for solutions there. Um, you know, when you think about just overall trends in the market, right? Um, you have things like passwordless authentication, which are closing down some threat vectors, right? Uh, yeah. You know, password one, two, three, that's going to close that threat vector. Fraudsters aren't going to pick up their stuff and go home. That's not how <laughs> that works. Um, they just move to other areas, right? And, um, you know, I think we're going to see uh, account opening as being a really key use case and point of attack. Um, and generative AI, AI is like pouring fuel on that, right? Uh, it increases the volume, it increases the effectiveness of that. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, that is a, a key, key area um, it, when we think about fraud that uh, we have to really consider here. Fantastic. Well, well, why we've got you. You mentioned some some statistics. I believe uh, Liminal had some research showing the kind of upward trend of adoption in in identity verification. Can you talk about that and maybe some of the main drivers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know when you think about kind of new digital uh, account opening growth, right? There are a couple big drivers you have to consider. One is kind of internet access overall. Um, this great S curve, um, internet access overall, right? Uh, if you even go back, you know, less than 10 years ago, right? You're talking about, you know, uh, around two thirds of folks globally had access to the internet uh, in some form, right? So that is trending up, um, that's driving growth. You also have to think about when you look at industry by industry, kind of digital penetration overall, right? Um, you know, Capital One probably 20 years ago, maybe wasn't onboarding a lot of folks uh, through digital channels. I would imagine, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that probably the vast majority of, of folks coming on uh, today are doing so digitally, um, right? So that trend is also increasing. Um, and just the number of accounts people are, are actually opening also increasing, right? Um, you think about even, you know, in banking and other industries, right? You're not just creating one account, one-time use, you're switching accounts, you're opening new accounts, right? That's increasing that growth trend. Um, you know, what we saw really is kind of leading up to say like a pre-COVID time, right? Uh, kind of growth right around probably, you know, we had a nine and a half percent kind of year over year there. Um, COVID obviously, you know, 2020, 21, 
you know, uh, kind of hockey stick effect there. You had right around 18% growth overall. Um, last 18 months, some of the macro market conditions, I think, have constricted that account opening growth. Um, but we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, over the, especially uh, recently with the threat of fraud and, you know, the kind of ongoing um, need to be compliant with regulations, which is another aspect right? Um, we are seeing this growth kind of reaccelerate and, and we're seeing kind of a second phase here of, of kind of um, accelerated growth where we're, we're expecting it to be, you know, near 14, 15% um, new user growth over the next few years here uh, through 2028. So I think we're seeing a, a big need, especially, um, you know, for solutions that, that can solve fraud and, and also ensure, you know, I'm sure Capital One, very important, that you're compliant uh, as well with regulations. So. Absolutely, very important compliance with regulations. You know, I, I think it's it, at least it's easy for me to think about, you know, identity ver identity verification. You know, signing up for a services an account at a bank or a financial institution. But it's a lot more. There are many more ways that customers interact with financial institutions. Uh, Stephanie, right? It isn't just I'm an account holder, holder and I want to put some money in the bank or I want a credit card. There are, are such a wide range of services under different brands uh, delivered across different technologies. I mean, it's, it's the plethora of, of avenues where you need to do that identity verification is quite broad. Can you say, say some about that? Yeah, yes, um, absolutely. And a hundred percent. And I, um, you know, while we're speaking about the financial industry here, I think that also applies broadly uh, across large service organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the one of the key points that um, that I got from Gartner actually, you know, they talk about the convergence of fraud detection, identity proofing, and authentication to have a really comprehensive approach to securing digital channels. I think that is a critical um, aspect of, of building out strategies to get better at this and preventing fraud um, as we move forward is because we have so many channels and so many services and so many opportunities, you know, are we thinking of those, are we able and positioned to think of those holistically and in terms of our defense and compliance and customer experience and balancing all of that not only in the single experiences, but across those various um, touch points. And I think to, to Will's point too, um, you, can, you can do really well at securing one of those points and then you know, the fraudster will skip the door and go through the window, right? So um, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. that balance, I think is, is really critical. They only have to be right once, right? Or successful yeah. once, correct? Yeah, yeah. that adage. Um, uh, you know, why don't we turn a little bit to um, another topic that we wanted to discuss talking about, you know, uh, it's one thing to say we want to onboard customers. Great. Well, that could be a great experience. That could be, you know, thank you. I don't want to do business with you <laughs> based on that first experience. Uh, so you've got to balance, you know, the security fraud and uh, fraud prevention, the kind of information that you need, but also in the process that you go through that experience with the customers have, I think we've learned a lot about how to do that much more successfully. And I'm really curious your thoughts on some of the best practices on that, Stephanie. Yes, um, absolutely. And so, you know, I, we mentioned a couple of different things, right? But there's, there's fraud prevention, there's compliance at any large organization, and then there's customer experience. And I think finding that balance is, is something that all organizations are continuously working on. Um, but generally large institutions like ours have processes or checks and balances, so to speak, in place that, that ensure that that balance is maintained. So whenever we're launching a new product or service or making changes to an existing product or service, typically that's something done as a collective. Uh, various stakeholders come to the table to represent those different perspectives. So we'll have, you know, somebody from fraud at the table, somebody from cyber at the table, somebody, you know, our business stakeholders, our sales, marketing, et cetera, to represent that broad set of, of perspectives. 
And it's really in that broad representation that we come to a consensus where we find what we think is the best balance across all of those tiers, you know, the compliance, customer experience and fraud. And then obviously there's, uh, there's a key point about you may come to a, a point where you think this is balanced, but then you, you put that change in the market and do you have the right information to be able to continuously monitor and ensure that you are, um, that you are maintaining that balance, especially in an environment where things are shifting so rapidly. Interesting. Any, any thoughts, comments, Will or Blair? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Stephanie really hit on it, right? I mean, there's a lot of folks involved in this decision because, you know, uh, it is the main way a lot of uh, people are interacting with enterprises like Capital One, right? It's digital channels, right? It's, uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, less walking through the physical door, right? This is the digital door. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks have a say in that. And I think really what we're seeing and, and what we found is, um, you know, partly solution providers, uh, it's, it's really about having a, a solution that can kind of speak to the benefits for each person, right? Um, the person, you know, in marketing and, and customer experience, they want traffic in, right? The person in fraud wants fraud out. The person in compliance wants regulators happy, right? You got to do all those things. Um, and so, you know, kind of having a complete comprehensive solution, um, you know, allows each stakeholder, because it's not just one stakeholder, um, to have their uh, kind of needs met. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing a lot of value from, you know, really kind of more complete solutions versus, you know, sometimes you might have, you know, singular kind of endpoint solutions that solve one business need, but kind of ignore the rest. Um, and that's really where we're kind of seeing a lot of the the drive for kind of these, you know, more robust platforms um, coming in. Excellent. Um, it, the one little aspect, I think we may have covered this pretty well. Uh, one of our audience members was asking about this uh, implementing identity verification process in a frictionless manner. That's a term that we, you know, use much more frequently, meaning it's not, you know, you don't, you're not running into barriers or things that are, you know, dragging down the user experience. Is there any learnings that we've had about things that help make it a frictionless experience? Mm. Gosh, I, I'll chime in a little bit. I mean, it's all, all about customer experience. I mean, you've got to progressively allow them to put in as little data as possible to, to get the process started. Um, mm -hmm. So asking for a, a government issued ID as being the first step probably isn't the right way to go. It's a pretty important step because it can extract data from a document and pre-fill forms without a user having to type those. But is it the right first step? Probably not, maybe an email address. So progressively move them into um, this onboarding process instead of giving them one form to fill out all of this stuff. They just become overwhelmed and, and abandoned. So that's one tip. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to talk, so jump in, Stephanie, <laughs> on this. Um, well, I was just, I mean, I 100% agree with with Blair, and, and I think there is there is also a um, push to – think through how do we do backgrounded identity verification, right? Like with not creating friction in a way that impedes part of the, the consumer's, you know, regular process. But the other thing that I'll, or twist sort of that I'll throw in here is, is that we've also found um, through industry research that um, customers are not as opposed to overt, you know, to, present in your face friction as one would think in the right experiences. And so I think that's just something to note. Um, there are scenarios where customers expect friction and that actually drives the feeling of security. Mm -hmm. And so while we don't wanna make that something that we present in every experience, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing always. Yeah, I, I... Stephanie, that was a great point. You, you took the point I was going to make. I think, you know, frictionless is kind of like uh, 
people say real time. It's nothing is actually, you know, real time, right? It's near real time. Um, you know, I, I do think you have to balance that with security because if I'm opening a bank account and, you know, all I have to do is, you know, give my, the first letter of my name, I'm going to say, wait a minute, that was way too easy. And now I feel really nervous about mm-hmm. opening this account and putting my money in there. Um, so the friction has to meet kind of the, the use case, right? Uh, you know, different if you're opening a bank account than if you're opening, you know, an e-commerce account, maybe, right? Um, it, it has to match the use case. Um, and in some that, you know, there's the additional security you get is actually, it, it is a better UX than having less quote unquote friction for sure. Yeah, yeah that's too easy. I appreciate it. <laughs> too easy. I know confidence. something's wrong. Yeah. Say Blair, um, take us, take us in this direction, if you would. Um, give us a little bit of a behind the scenes look at how IDV technology is used in the detection of fraud and how we verify IDs during this uh, kind of account enrollment process. Yeah, I'd be happy to. What slide is up right now? Can you tell me? Um, I I have so let me bring some up. We have some, I think they said you'd like to reference. Okay. We have slide um, three. Sorry, my bad. I jumped here. Slide three. What is the title? It, oh, I'm sorry. It's the uh, identify identity proof steps from onboarding to reauthentication. So ah, perfect. I love it. Okay. This is, I love this visual. Title. Okay. Yeah, the visual is is pretty good, but this visual is probably something that most of you have gone through before, um, and, and have seen before. Ten years ago, when we started this company, this was a brand new concept. So the concept in the past was to prove identity, uh, as Will was talking about, let's ask him to make a model of his first car, his cat's name, his mortgage payment last month. And if Will can answer those, it must really be Will. What we found is that data is super vulnerable and it's been breached and all of our data is in the hands of a lot of different people. So it's no longer safe and no longer the best practice for onboarding a new customer, particularly in a high risk or a regulated industry. So to raise the bar a little bit, the you know the first step, the gold standard for proving identity across the globe in an account opening scenario is to present your government issued ID. But if you think about the absurdity of that, there are we support over twelve thousand different identity documents around the globe. Um, maybe my Wells Fargo branch associate could get pretty good at recognizing the Georgia driver's license, but to understand 12,000 different documents uh, is pretty tough. So what we do is raise the bar significantly, Mitch. Uh, We just ask the user to present their government issued ID. They're able to do this remotely. They don't have to go into a branch or a store to do this. Um, They simply take a picture of the front and the back of their ID. We make that very easy for the user by putting it in video, the camera in video mode. They just have to point it at in the direction of a document. We'll sense that a document is there, start analyzing every frame that 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 phone will produce. And as soon as we sense optimal conditions, which could be very, very quickly, we're going to snap the perfect picture for that consumer that has good lighting, great focus, all four corners of the document in view. Um, we're going to submit that document for authentication. And when we talk about document authentication, people always kind of scratch their head. What really happens under the covers here? We do have another slide that I'm going to go into more detail, but it is not us pinging the DMV going to, I just referenced the state of Georgia. It's not going to the state of Georgia and saying, does all this information on this document match what you have on file? We have done that for other large banks. Uh, And what we've found is that validating, because all you have the ability to do when you validate directly with the issuer of a document is to validate the biographic elements, attributes on that document. So in running for one of the top banks in the country for a couple of years, we would do the document authentication, tell the bank whether the document was real or not. Uh, 
Um, and then they would take the data that we scraped from the document and run it up against the issuer. What we found was that about 85, 90% of the time that we said a document was fake, we know that it's a fake document, the data that was on that document would actually match what was on file with the issuer. So I'm getting a little bit digressed here from what this flow is. But anyway, the process is super fast, completely automated. Take a quick picture of the front of your document. Take a quick picture of the front of your face. What happens in a fully automated way in about six seconds time is we run 2,000 or so. It depends on the identity document. Every identity document has a different number of security features, patterns, data that we can run our algorithms on. But in general, roughly 2,000 different tests on an ID to see if it's real, if it's been digitally manipulated or not, or if it's a flat out counterfeit. Um, we match the person at the end of the transaction, again in real time, to the headshot that's on that ID. We make sure that that headshot on the ID hasn't been manipulated using some sort of generative AI or generative face creator. Then for um, a lot of our customers take advantage of the next step or the next phase in the process, and that's called fraud shield. So every time that we take a picture of an ID, we're scraping all the data from that document, we're scraping the face, the biometrics from that document. And we, a lot of our customers have a set of banned people that they never want to do business with again, They've, you know, for whatever reason. Our customers have the ability to put those banned people into our fraud shield repository. And we take the biographic data from the document, the biometric data from the document, run it through fraud shield to see if we've ever seen that person before. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen the same face on more than a hundred different identity documents, all containing different PII. Mm -hmm. So I've already talked about the fact that this is a fully automated process. All five of those steps that you see on the left side happen in about six seconds time. So the user doesn't even really know what's going on. It just happens before they, they have a clue. Whereas other people that do this end up having to send these images to, because they don't have the right kind of technology, send it to people, um, which you know really delays the process, A, doesn't add efficacy to the process. I'm an expert at this, and I guarantee I'd meet, miss at least half of the counterfeits that came across my desk. But lastly, it adds a lot of time. So the fact that we're able to do this very, very quickly Without humans, also the other benefit that you reap is there's no bias introduced into the equation. Uh, anytime that humans start looking at IDs, they have inherent bias, and they're gonna that bias is going to take over and may impact their decision making. Which for a large bank that has all kinds of obligations to be equitable to all consumers, that presents a problem. Um, and I'll finish off this slide very quickly with the added benefit that you get. Phil Will talked earlier about how eliminating passwords can really eliminate a ton of attack vectors. And that's what this whole process on the left allows our customers to do. Once we've seen your ID once and seen your face once, we know who you are. In the future, the next time that you come visit my property, you don't have to put in a username. You don't have to put in a password. You can simply show your face. And with our advanced liveness detection capabilities, we're able to know that it's really Blair that's showing his face and without typing a thing, allow him access and authorization into his account. So it's pretty cool stuff I think we do over here, Mitch. It's fantastic. You know, um, and I know you have a second slide on ID tampering that we'd love to have you talk about. It actually fits nicely. One of the questions that came from our audience is what do you do about deep fakes, right? You're talking about the uh, facial recognition and how you use, how you use that as, as uh, part of your technology. Um, if you'd like, I'll go ahead and put up that 
Uh, no, I've got it. I've got it up in front of me. So sorry, I, I probably can't see your screen anyway. But uh, yeah, I know this this one pretty well, and I'll definitely touch on the deep fake aspect. And for those of you fraudsters that have joined today to figure out our playbook and how you can get by a system like Authentic IDs, um, you're wasting your time because I'm not going to give away the playbook. But we will talk about the bookshelves and the way that it works. I've already kind of beaten home the fact that this is a hundred percent automated document analysis. But what do we look at? It used to be, and I've been in this business where we did it for the public sector, customs and border protection agencies, homeland security, age, critical infrastructure facilities like that. It used to be that you base your analysis on whether a document was real or not on visual on visual representations, do the watermarks, do the patterns that we expect is, exist, exist, do the holograms exist, do we get the right color placement or the right color response and the perfect placement on the document. Um, we rely more and more, or less and less, I should say, on analyzing a document visually Yes, we find a lot of mistakes that are made by the counterfeiters visually, but we also find ourselves faced with some pretty prolific organized crime groups that make available perfect templates for users. Virtually any identity document that you want around the globe, you can buy the template that visually, if you were to look at that identity document, it's going to look real to a human. It's going to take the type of forensic analysis that we perform in order to detect the fact that that's a fake. So we look at a variety of things beyond just what's contained visually on the document. We do a ton of analysis. We've got a bunch of data scientists that all these, the data that are on these documents that may look like just random numbers they really aren't random numbers. There's an algorithm to that. There's a reason that those numbers and those alphanumeric strings are, are on your document. They say something. And if you know what, what you're looking for, uh, we can detect. And, and the fraudsters make tons of mistakes there. Um, we look at behavior. So when the concept here is when a, a real person is going through the process of imaging their real ID and their real face, they act in a very specific manner and pattern. They use certain cameras. They hold their device in a certain way. Again, I won't give away our playbook, but one thing that happens in, in that bookshelf of algorithms and tests that run is if when you're prompted to take a selfie of your face, you were to use the rear camera versus the front facing camera, that's anomalous behavior. It may not necessarily mean you're a fraudster, but it's kind of odd. So it's one of the data points that goes into our ultimate decision. And then lastly, we look at the EXIF data. Um, was that image really captured live and in person? Did it come from the location you asserted you were at and, and things like that? So there's uh, a, an overview, if you will, Mitch, of what happens under the covers at Authentic ID. Fantastic. Interesting and reassuring <laughs> that that's all happening. Uh, I'm glad you're not just verifying just the watermark, you know, the things we used to do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy. Say, so, Will, we'd love to have you talk about um, the ROI on these types of technologies. Obviously, it's got to be effective, but it's also, you know, the, delivering the value and how much you invest and the return on that. I know you've got some some data, some thoughts about that that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, uh, and I don't know if we have the slide. Yeah, there we go. Any good consultant has a slide. Um, uh, you know, where we actually see kind of uh, the value come back to, you know, the, the enterprise really, um, you know, it's, it's um, for what we kind of term our integrated identity platforms, right? Which are platforms across that life cycle. Um, you know, 15.3 X, which means every dollar invested, you get, you know, $15 and 30 cents back. Um, really what we're seeing here is there's kind of three main areas we focus in on. One is, you know, the conversion of more good customers. Um, right. I think Blair said six seconds for that process. It's not a lot of time. If it was six minutes, you're going to have customer drop off. Right. Um, and you know, that customer may come back, may never come back. 
right? So converting more customers adds more value to your, to your business. Um, second big piece here is uh, reducing kind of that overhead from integration. I mean, you're, you're talking about people overhead, you're talking about implementation costs, et cetera, right? Having a full suite solution that can kind of do that whole experience um, reduces a lot of the uh, kind of cost centers for enterprises like Capital One. Um, and the last piece here is really around um, the fraud uh, savings back to the actual enterprise. Now there's also savings back to the the end consumer, right? Because you, you know, you, 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 you break into someone's account, you're taking their actual money, right? That's a person's money um, as well as the enterprise. And we see, you know, significant return when talking to buyers to having that kind of full end to end solution. Um, you know, so from an ROI perspective, you know, uh, getting a solution that can really, uh, you know, support um, the, you know, the onboarding and the, the life cycle of a customer, really important, not just um, to do things, you know, like reduce fraud overall, but um, actually driving value back to that business. Um, so the right solution really, uh, you know, pays for itself 15 fold here. Um, okay, you're fine. Anything, uh, did you cover this also or anything? Yeah, about? yeah. I, I think, you know, here, you know, at the end of the day, right, um, you know, enterprises care about their customers uh, and, you know, the, the value is passed back to their customers. Um, obviously, things like a better experience, a better journey, some of those, you know, not necessarily dollars and cents, but certainly something that the customer feels, um, you know, and I think, you know, to the point I think Stephanie made, right, is consumers want to feel protected, right? Um, and knowing that they're protected, knowing that they're insured, especially if you're talking about something like financial services, right, where, you know, it's someone's potentially life savings um, somewhere, right? They need to feel secure. Um, and having a solution that does that is, I think, paramount to building, you know, trust if you're an enterprise with that end consumer, which at the end of the day, that's what you have to do to kind of maintain that relationship. Um, and so, you know, investing in solutions that can do that, it, it adds value, you know, beyond just your enterprise, it has value back to your actual, uh, the actual consumer, the end user, uh, as well. Very good. Hey, we want to put up um, our first question, the one we showed earlier. Uh, Cody, if you can pop up that first poll question, get an idea of sort of where people are on their, on their journey about having a strategy for verifying identities and, of course, finding fraudsters. So please vote. We'll, we'll get to see kind of where folks are. Interesting. It's real valuable because a lot of us want to know where I think I'm here, but I wonder where everybody else am I behind? Am I ahead? Am I where I should be? So give you an idea of at least the folks who self-selected to come to a webinar about the topic. Um, if, uh, if we got enough data there, if we have enough data. Oh, good, good. It's rolling in. So oh, novice at, uh, a novice plan that primarily relies on manual process. Okay. Things are shifting a little bit. A good plan that needs some perfecting. Half. That's interesting. And they're still getting some boats rolling in here. Good. But we've got a good number of recipients. Anybody else wants to vote? Do so quickly. Um, Blair, any thoughts, comments on, on the data you're seeing here? Yeah, for first of all, 26% of you are using manual review. Don't do that. Get rid of that immediately. Um, I, I'm an expert. If you think the people that you're employing to look at these IDs can tell the difference between a real and a fake, they can't. Um, it, they can't do it quickly. And you're paying a lot more money for those people to do this than you could from an automated solution that can actually do it fast and do it accurately. Uh, Glad to see that we've got a good plan that needs some perfecting by darn near half the audience. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Kind of the have-nots and haves in this audience, right? We don't have something or it's manual or we have a great, a good plan kind of thing. <laughs> Very good. Uh, if you can take that down, Cody, that would be fantastic. Uh, Stephanie, uh, kind of fin finish thing, things up here, getting on to our last topic. Uh We've talked a lot about enrollment. 
of course, that relationship with that customer starts there, right? Maybe expands there, but they're, they're with us. We hope they're with us for some time. What, what are the best practices for kind of mitigating and fraud and watching once someone's already gone through and uh, begun that relationship with you and, and uh, entered in, into your business with you? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think we collectively hit on a lot of these points, but just investing in fraud prevention across the various touch points and engagements of that, you know, uh, consumer journey and not just at the enrollment stage, which is very critical, um, but also monitoring that um, both customer and fraud behavior is just as critical as investing in the customer experiences. Um, you know, the same way consumers are continuously evolving and changing the way they interact with us, so are fraudsters. And so the more that you can understand their behavior and specifically how they are performing or reacting across that those various touch points, but from a holistic environment perspective, then you can start to build out a roadmap and stay ahead of those trends and not continuously be reacting to them. And I, I did see a couple of comments in the chat as well around, you know, are you using various attributes? And I think Blair went into a couple of them as well, but just, um, you know, the more uh, information that you have on, on a, a fraudster's behavior and interaction across those various touch points, the easier it is to then think through how we might get ahead of that and what are the right technologies that are in various different states of evolution um, to start to try out uh, and pilot, you know, to see how they can, can potentially help mitigate some of that. Very good. You know, one of the questions I wanted to toss out there, um, Blair, you were talking about the process, the enrollment process and the technology and capturing the selfie. One of our audience members wanted to know a little bit about where does the selfie get stored? Um, you know, you you mentioned about giving your data to this entity application business. Um, so people are always interested, well, where are you, where are you putting my data? And where is that all going? Uh, thoughts sure, around no. that? Sure, you get yeah, that question. No, I, yeah, we do, and the answer is we're we're super flexible. Uh, everybody has different risk appetites, and mm. everybody wants to kind of wade into face in in a variety of different ways. So, pretty flexible. We have scenarios where our customer, our customer being a big bank or a big telco ask us to store the face for subsequent authentications. Let me clear up a, a mystery here though. We're not storing your face, folks. We have no idea what your face looks like at all. So your face is converted. There's, there, we don't see your makeup, your hair, no, nothing like that. It's converted to landscape or to landmarks throughout your face, which is then converted into a template. That template is then one way hashed and that is what is stored. So if somebody were to ever able to break into our, I don't know how many layers of security, but tons of security and gain access to that repository, they would get absolutely nothing. Those are irreversible one-way hashes. Um, so it can be stored by us. It can be stored by our customer. We're also working on some novel encryption technologies that would allow that facial biometric to be stored, not even as a biometric any longer due to the way that the, the encryption works right on the consumer's device. So we would never have it, our customer would never have it. You would be able to re-authenticate with that template, if you will, never leaving your device. There are pros and cons to all three approaches. And we can talk through all three of those. We certainly don't have enough time here in the next five minutes to talk about those pros and cons. But a variety of different methods is the short answer. Very good. Very good. Well, speak, speaking of that, why don't we uh, just kind of everybody, if you want to think of a parting thought, last thought on our topic today, we need a little bit of time because we've got some gift cards to give away. Um, and Will, I'm going to ask you and then Stephanie and, and Blair to share sort of what's a what's a, a takeaway you want to make sure that everybody has from today's session 
Uh, I'm on the spot. Well, I'm hoping to get the, the gift card too. So um, definitely sticking around <laughs> for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that poll I'm just going to is really interesting. You know, I think a lot of folks felt like they were just just there. I would say it is a little bit of a, you know, fighting fraud is a little bit of a moving puck. Right. Um, and so if you think you're there today, that doesn't mean you're going to be there tomorrow. Um, and so. Um, you know, if you're, you know, out in market and, and kind of thinking about how to how to prepare yourself as, as kind of a company or enterprise here, I think you need to constantly reevaluate your procedures and, and kind of how you are doing things um, to make sure that you stay ahead of things. I think um, we are uh, I think it was the first topic we talked about where we're expecting, uh, you know, a rise, especially in synthetic identity fraud. Um, and so if you are saying, hey, I think we have this covered today, uh, it's it's getting more sophisticated. The volumes are increasing. Um, I think, you know, you need to really start developing the next strategy today. So. It's not a moving target. It's multiple moving targets, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stephanie, if, would you take a minute parting thought? Yeah, of course. And I'll just sort of jump on, on Will's train of thought there. But um, I think for me as a product manager and just in the industry, it's there are so many layers to biometric technology and, and it's evolving really quickly as well. And while we talk about, you know, AI and, and voice biometrics and that helping fraudsters, like there's also the good side of those technologies as well that we as organizations can leverage. And it's having a huge influence and impact in how businesses think about their digital experiences as a, as a whole, which is really exciting. And I think, you know, we need to be thoughtful in how we approach these experiences to make sure that we're finding that balance of compliance, fraud, customer experience. But I just personally am, am very excited about the, the number of opportunities that there are to help really bridge that gap and find uh, a good customer experience that is secure um, in, in a digital environment. Very good. Blair, before you respond, I want to thank you, Authentic ID and the full team for putting on today's uh, session and bringing uh, these experts together with us. So thank you. Your, your parting thought? Thank you, Stephanie. I think you summed it up real nicely. I don't know how I topped that, but I, I kind of did evade the question earlier and it's, it's tangential to what you discussed. So we use AI for good to fight the AI for bad. The previous question that I neglected to talk about was chat GPT. Don't be scared, folks. I, I know that the media has sensationalized this and, and really frightened the heck out of all of you. And there are some unprepared companies out there that don't have the right solutions for authentication in place. But if you have the right solutions in place, this is not really a concern today. If you think about what all these LLMs do, it's create synthetic data. Synthetic data is not real people, right? It's synthetic and it has to be replayed somehow. It has to be replayed through a telephone, through a computer screen. It has to be injected into a computer feed. There's a variety of different mechanisms but today we're able to recognize those signals. We're able to tell the difference between real people and synthesized faces, synthesized voices. So, you know, it's a continuous battle like it always has been. We're, they're gonna get better, but today I feel pretty confident that we're able to stop uh, those deep fake attacks despite how sophisticated they are. The good guys are working hard. <laughs> well, Cody, yeah. with that, we're going to turn it back to you, let you give away a gift, some gift cards and uh, close out the show. All right. Sounds good, Mitch. And, and Will, Blair, and Stephanie, thank you all so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure getting to speak with you. Um, so I do just want our to pleasure. remind our, I do want to remind our audience today that this session was recorded you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand, or of course you can find it living on the Security Boulevard webs website. Just visit securityboulevard.com slash webinars and be sure to look in the on demand section where it will be waiting for you. Now onto our four $25 Amazon gift card winners. They are Haral T, Agnes S, 
Rudy L, and Francis Z. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim your gift card. We, we will reach out to you in the next 48 hours or so. If you don't happen to see that email, check your spam folder just in case it happens to get filtered out. Once again, I'd like to thank Authentic ID for sponsoring our program. I'd like to thank Stephanie, Will, and Blair, and Mitch for joining us. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this past hour. We really appreciate your time, and we want to hear your feedback. So there is not only a link in the chat, but if you just stick around with us uh, after we take this off the air, you will be redirected to a post-webinar survey, and we would love to hear your thoughts. Whether they're about today's program or if you have suggestions for upcoming topics, please do let us know, and we want to bring you the content that you want to see. Um, so all that being said, thank you so much for joining us. You may now disconnect. Have a great rest of your day.